please welcome to the stage, Pedro Mendez. Good morning. How are we? Good morning, CCC AOE. How are we this Friday morning? Excellent, excellent. You know, I'm actually really excited about this next presenter. Um, as a student of economics myself, I, I really appreciate his words at every CCC AOE. I think this is going to be the fifth CCC AOE conference that he presents at. And um, he returns once again by popular demand, um, who I have the pleasure of presenting is uh, Dr. Eiler. He presently serves as interim vice president of governmental relations and is a professor of economics at Sonoma State University. He is a visiting scholar at the University of Bologna and uh, Stanford University. He is, his expertise is well known in our California community college system. Um, he has uh, provided uh, presentations on a variety of topics, including economic overviews and recovery presentations to sector uh, impact webinars on global trade, advanced manufacturing, agriculture, health, digital media, IT, uh, career education areas. So um, I am excited about the nuggets of information that he's gonna provide us today, associate to our uh, national uh, economic and employment uh, situations in California, as well as state trends. So please, please wel uh, welcome Dr. Robert Eiler to the stage. Good morning, folks. Well, I'm going to walk you through the national, state, and regional economies around California. What I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to put a workforce spin on it in the sense that what I'm going to tell you initially is where we think as economists the national economy is going as context for the state of California. I'm going to tell you some regional ideas about what's been going on in the labor markets and some other things around the state, thinking about counties and regions. And then I'm going to try to get down to where we're actually thinking about occupations and who we train, the jobs we should be training for, and what the latest and greatest data suggests we're going to be about the middle part of the decade. So we're going to try to do that, we'll see if we can wrap all that up. The first stop is to talk about the national labor market. So in the, in the next six or seven slides, I'm going to try to take you all the way from what's going on with jobs to what's going on in Eastern Europe. But what I want to show you is the, where we're at from an American standpoint, from a national standpoint. That blue line represents the recovery from the Great Recession in terms of the total volume of workers in the United States. So if you start in November 2007 and you move forward from there, it took about 78 months to get back to where we were exactly equal to the same number of workers that we were right before the Great Recession began. So it's basically a six and a half year period where we had no growth, okay? hence the so-called Great Recession, okay? This is what the COVID-19 recovery looks like. We're almost, we're 99.2% back to where we were in January, 2020, which means we probably are going to go back to the same volume of workers we were at right before COVID-19 really seized up the labor markets in our economy sometime in the next few months, okay? These data are seasonally adjusted. So you can see how much more smooth the recovery has been over the last 12 or 15 months, but steadily climbing up. Here's the problem potentially, and I'm going to show you this in the next slide. While it's true that we have, recovery, or we have recovered, and we're basically going to be about 26 months from the beginning to the end of the trough that was created by COVID-19, the reallocation of workers within the American economy is one of the biggest questions going forward. What industries are going to gain workers because of what's happened with the pandemic? Which ones are going to lose them? And more, I think more important for the work that we all do as educators, which jobs and occupations are not coming back structurally that we might currently be training for thinking that they're always going to be here? I'll come back to that later. Now, the next big topic at the national level, in fact, I said it was going to be that next slide. I'm sorry, it's not going to be. It's going to be in a minute. The inflation levels are the other big story. So yes, the, the labor side of our economy continues to truck along. But one of the biggest concerns about that is, is are wages being paid in such a way to keep up what's been going on with prices and how much longer are relatively high levels of inflation going to stick around and why? So these data are what's known as the core personal consumption expenditures price index. Now, what that means is that there's a bunch of different ways of measuring how consumers buy goods and services and the prices they pay for those goods and services. This one is larger than the CPI 
in terms of its breadth. It's meant to cover every single good and service that we purchase as households in the American economy. It is the broadest based measure. And it's the one the Federal Reserve uses when it thinks about, if I increase interest rates, how is that affecting price levels? It's this graph specifically they're watching. So you'll notice that these data, or hopefully you can see this, these data are from 2007 to 2022 in terms of what we know, February 2022, on a monthly basis. We know those data, or at least we have estimates for those data. You can see that for most of that 14 year stretch or so, we stayed right around or below that dotted line, which is at 2% inflation. And in some hand wavy ways, that 2% inflation rate is meant to be the goal of monetary policy or what the Federal Reserve is trying to achieve in the United States. It's not a mandate, but it's kind of like a hand wavy indirect goal. And for the most part, the 2010s were typified by relatively slow and low moving prices. A lot of that a function of the hole that was created and slowly dug out of that six and a half year movement from 142 million workers back to 142 million workers in the previous graph. Okay, that'll slow down your inflation quite a bit when you have that kind of contraction in workers. But you can see after that very skinny shaded area about three quarters of the way moving left to right, which is the timeline of the COVID-19 recession, the briefest recession since the second world war, we've had this spike in prices, okay? So that increase in prices is not unprecedented, but it takes us back to a time and times we don't, do not like. So for example, how many people here remember A, sitting in a car in a line to get gasoline? Okay, so that's part one. Part two, how many people in here knew somebody or yourself had a mortgage that was somewhere around 10 or 12% interest? Okay, so we're getting, that's, it's reminding us a little bit of those times. The inflation rate is not that high, but the, the idea when you see a vertical climb like that, you say, well, where is the top, right? I don't like the vertical climb and I wanna know where it's actually gonna cap off. Well, you can see these red dotted lines. And if I show you the next little click here, it should shade that area. That shaded area is the current forecast for where prices are gonna go on an annualized basis moving forward. So you can see the first red dot drops down from the current peak, the next couple drop down, but they don't quite get back to that dotted line, okay? So inflation right now from a forecasted standpoint is forecasted to be relatively higher than it's been the previous basically 20 years on average, and maybe stick around a place where the Federal Reserve doesn't really want it, which is above that dotted line over the next few years. In a sense, structurally, it's changed. Okay, But let's think about what should happen. Here's the deal. I'm going to show you some graphs in a minute that suggest that the Federal Reserve is going to be on the move in terms of increasing interest rates because it cut them severely in 2020, basically right back to where we were with interest rates in 2008, 9, 10, all the way to 2015. Right? So we had severe cuts in interest rates trying to get us out of the Great Recession. We had them again in 2020, and only until March 2022, just a few weeks ago, had we picked them up just by a little bit. But will that help inflation? So what should we watch? Are prices actually falling or stabilizing? Okay. Are we getting rates to rise quickly and is it too quick? So one thing you might hear a little bit about over the next few weeks, if you're reading the news, is that as the Federal Reserve changes rates, are they changing them in such a way to create the beginnings of recession? I'll talk more about that in a minute. Our wage is going to continue to rise. So here's what happened, folks, if you've been watching the news. When the recession hit and we seized up our economy through the social policies with COVID-19, it took a little while to get workers back to work. But then there were people making choices on the supply side of our labor markets to maybe not take the job they used to have or not go back to work at all for an array of reasons. Well, that leaves employers with a little bit of a conundrum because the supposition was if you were working in February 2020, what's keeping you from coming back? Might have been safety. It might have been child care. It might have been dependent care. It might have been that now you've had this catharsis at home in which now you're really rethinking, should I go back to that same job? And again, an array of reasons. But the one thing employers don't want to do is immediately increase wages to reattract a workforce because those are very hard to unwind. And in some cases, for example, where I work, there's union contracts for which you can't easily do that. So there's, there was a lot of friction, and this is the classic word that economists use to think about when things are not working, right? There's these frictions in the market that slowly played out. So you heard things like, well, we'll give you a $500 signing bonus for taking this job, right? But we're going to give you the same wage but take the $500 in cash, here's the $500 bills, and please come work for us. No, it's not enough. So that took about four or five months for employers to finally say, okay, 
I'm now going to cry uncle, and it's time to now increase wages. And then we started to see wage competition, and that has happened. Now, why I'm saying that is that vertical climb is somewhat propelled by that slow and steady increase in wages that's starting to trickle through a bunch of supply chains that starts to feed inflation generally. So will wages continue to rise is a big deal going forward. The another one that's a big deal is how much higher are housing prices going to go. So if you own a home, the last two years have been an amazing run because the last recession was disastrous, right? So if you think about that, but if you, that's, now notice I had to qualify that. If you own a home, if you don't own a home and you've been renting and you were February, 2020 and said, man, we're so close, we're so close. And rates just got cut in 2019. So that's good. We're closing in, closing in, boom. Rates went down again, but then prices skyrocketed. So now my wage will not allow me to, five, six years from now, afford that house because it's now 35% higher. I'm going to show you a bunch of data from, from around California. Very few places in California have been untouched by higher housing prices. So if housing prices continue to rise, one of the biggest portions of our monthly consumer bundle, if you will, is wrapped up in housing. So as housing prices have gone up, it's forced this inflation rate to go higher too. So when you hear about the Federal Reserve in increasing interest rates, they're really trying to affect that blue line and move it down through those dots that are shaded. But like everything else in economics, there's going to be some cost to that. It will slow down housing prices. It is likely to slow down employment. Thus, it will slow down wage pressure, which will then transmit itself to a slower inflation rate. But there is no silver bullet short of uh, technological change to move the economy forward at slow and low inflation rates and get wage and income gains right alongside. We have not had that yet. Okay. The trickiest part for policymakers, we don't know which demand or supply is the one driving it. So we have these two stories about why we have inflation. One, supply chains have been problematic. Hence, it's when demand is less than, there's more than supply, inflation wants to rise. And we've had a bunch of fiscal and monetary stimulus. We've had a bunch of government payments and we have interest rates driven way down to historically low levels. We want to consume under those conditions so demand exceeds supply. Policy addresses demand only. If the supply side of our global economy remains somewhat unchecked and, un and problematic in terms of moving from production to retail, prices are going to remain, remain, I'm sorry, relatively elevated. Okay. So always in your mind thinking, demand greater than supply means inflation pressure. Okay. Well, consumers are looking at that and saying, hey, this is not good. So the University of Michigan does what, generally speaking, is a, rel a relatively well-accepted way of surveying, surveying, I'm sorry, consumer sentiment. And it's very much like any other consumer confidence index. This is the wobbliness you get, though, with consumers. Look how jagged that is. Consumers generally are extremely fickle people or parts of our economy. And it's very jagged up and down all over the place. But the two things to really look for in this black line is when it starts to decline down, those shaded areas that represent recession start to become a higher probability of happening. And this is the six month moving average to kind of flatten out some of those bumps. But when it's going down, we start to worry as economists, okay? Historically speaking, when it's going down in trend, a recession is just about to hit. So this has got people a little nervous, but if you think about all the vectors that have hit consumers, COVID-19, rising inflation, rising geopolitical tensions in Eastern Europe, there's a lot of reasons why consumers might be a little concerned. But the reason why we think this is important is because if consumers get concerned and they start to sit on their hands with respect to demand, that starts to slow down revenues and it starts to trickle backward into the economy. In other words, slowing down our, econ our economic growth and ultimately creating recession. Okay, you can see that shaded area. That's where the recent like seven, seven or eight months have shown their face in terms of this downturn and trend that we don't like. Now, with some perspective. Interest rates are gonna be a big story over the next 12 months and it's gonna dominate the news to a certain extent. This is a look at the 10 year treasury rate or the, what the government, when the government borrows money, paying it back in 10 years with interest. This is the interest rate they've paid over the last almost 40 years now. It'll be, well, it's just a little bit over 40 now because it's actually through the end of February. So when you look at this graph, one of the things we, we get funny about it is people say, God, well, interest rates have really gone up. And in the last seven or eight weeks, they have gone up very strongly. And in fact, I hopefully have that shaded at the very right-hand side, but you can see two things very quickly. One, notice how low those interest rates are versus the previous 40 years. So we are still at very historic low prices in terms of credit, okay? But since COVID-19 ended and we've, we've seen some adjustments in our economy, that rate has crept up. Now, why am I showing you the 10-year treasury? 
The 10 year treasury rate is the foundational rate upon which mortgage rates are set. So when the 10 year rate creeps up, mortgage rates want to creep up basically hand in hand with a little bit extra uh, premium on top. What have we seen with mortgage rates the last six or seven weeks? They've gone up significantly, okay? So there was a period between, let's say May, 2020 and January, 2022, where a lot of refinancing activity took place. The cool thing about refinancing activity is it shores up household balance sheets. So if you think about what happened in 2007, eight and nine, we avoided that problem because banks, credit unions and lenders in general really worked with their borrowers to refinance themselves, especially if they lost jobs and try to better afford staying in their home. And we did not see the supply side of our housing markets surge like we saw in 2007, eight and nine. We actually saw demand surge instead. But now we're creeping out of that and we've had an enormous amount of demand stimulus that naturally pulls those rates up. So is the end of the housing market boom coming and how will that drift into construction markets over the next few years? Hold on, I'm coming back to that. Okay, this is kind of a fun graph because it's something that we think about where's the Federal Reserve gonna go? And this is how, this is how weird things have been the last six months in terms of trying to predict where interest rates are going. The, shaded area, that box and that arrow is where the Federal Reserve saw themselves headed six months ago. In the latest survey, those dots represent policymakers' straw poll stance in the latest meeting about what to do about interest rates and where they see things going annually. So that the dots right above the shaded box or that box in the arrow right above the box is this year. The box represents where they were for this year six months ago. So they have significantly increased where they think interest rates need to be to fight inflation. But how that increase in interest rates changes the way businesses look at buying productive capital, which then has employment demand right alongside of it, usually slows all that down. So the Federal Reserve knows to fight inflation, they are gonna to have to slow down some of the current momentum in our labor markets, in our equity markets, in our housing markets, and in our business investment markets, which means workers are not going to see the same amount of growth over the next six, let's say 12 or 18 months, I'm sorry, than we've seen the previous 12 or 18. You had to expect that, but now it's going to come by force through policy. Okay. And folks, there's thousands of websites changing daily on this graph, thousands of pundits out there trying to make predictions and trying to make some money off of trying to be ahead of the market. The main thing to recognize is interest rates are going to rise and we need to be watching how businesses make employment decisions as a result of that. And that's basically the prescription we're looking at over the next year and a half. Okay, I'm going to move us through this a little bit more quickly than the data would otherwise show you. Amy will have this presentation if you want to dig into those numbers more deeply. That top panel that I just got done highlighting are the quarterly forecasts as of February 2022 for three main variables in our economy. The first couplet is real gross domestic product growth as a percentage. The second couplet is the unemployment rate. And the third one is inflation rates. Okay. But those are quarterly, and there's been so much volatility over the last three months, really since this forecast came out, that the quarterly is going to get a lot of adjustment in May when they redo this. this, for, this these forecasts come from a, an interview process that the Philadelphia Federal Reserve does with 40 economists that all those folks do is forecast what's going on in the American economy. That's their job basically every day of the week. And so every quarter, they ask them, well, where do you think things are going over the next, let's say, four or five quarters and over the next three, four years? This is the annual one that we really should look at. The forecast from about seven weeks ago was for the next few years, a little bit of a slowdown in growth. So that smaller shaded area that starts with the number 3.7 to its left with the column that starts 3.9 is the previous quarter's forecast for the growth rate of income in our economy over the entire year of 2022. So there was a bit of a downgrade for 2022. There was a bit of an upgrade for 23 and basically not no change for 24 and now not much difference for 25. Two things in there. Even with everything I've told you, the Federal Reserve generally and economists generally do not see a recession yet coming through 2025. We see growth slowing down. Now, the trickiness in that is two items. Two things have happened since this forecast came out. One, the Federal Reserve, in the graph I just showed you with all the dots, has suddenly become way more aggressive about what they intend to do with interest rates. That aggression is likely to, to turn down some of these forecasts. That's why I just kind of flew through the quarterlies because the quarterlies are going to jump all over the place based on that new news. The second is what's going on in Eastern Europe. Okay. 
The third, which you could say is point 2B, is that we really don't know what we're going to see with COVID-19. So another thing that happened is that Shanghai shut down for a while and still is kind of under more or less a shutdown situation uh, as a result of another outbreak. Will that continue to pop up? And how is that going to continue to affect the supply side of our global economy and have pressure on inflation, which then pressures real growth or inflation-adjusted growth, which is that shaded area that starts at 3.7 over the next few years? The unemployment rate along, line, along those same lines looks like it's going to be really good, right? So in your basic macroeconomics class, we teach that numbers below 4% are amazing unemployment rate outcomes. And to a certain extent, we recovered very strongly. Of course, we put an enormous amount of policy effort into doing that. We wrote checks to people's homes. We wrote checks to people's employers. We lowered interest rates to the lowest possible level we could. So we gave all the potential stimulus for people to come back to work. And it looks like by the middle of this year, that will have happened. What's the trickiness in that? Those numbers, while relatively low, we know people have exited the labor force. So let's remind ourselves about something with the unemployment rate, because this is something that usually shows up in the news, like top line item in your Twitter feed or on your newspaper and your nightly news when it happens. The unemployment rate is a ratio of the number of people who are actively seeking work, but have not found a job in the, over the summation of the folks that are working in the same people who are actively seeking work. It's the percentage of our labor force that is currently unemployed. But if that labor force has shrunk in such a way that the folks that have left would have been unemployed otherwise, the unemployment rate will run down at a faster speed than what is really reflective of the labor market. So if we have people who are sitting at home who would have lost their job anyway and have exited the labor force, that number is going to get to a smaller point because the people that are left are either highly employable and are finding work basically, and we're down to what an economist would call frictional unemployment. People are just kind of shifting between jobs. If they don't have a job right now, it's because they're basically looking for a new one rather than for some other reason. And are we ever going to get those people to come back in the labor force? So one of the things to watch for over the next few quarters is that we might see unemployment creep up a little bit because people are now suddenly saying, wow, if the wages are that high and I don't see a whole other relief in sight, I better take a job while the getting is good. So they'll come in, fill that job, but it might take a couple of months. And so we might see some wobbliness in that. And you can see it sort of bottom out in 2023 and then pick back up again. Some of that's in there. But be very cautious when you hear unemployment falling because we've got a lot of convolution in our labor force right now. And I'll come back and talk about that when we talk about California in a minute. There's that same inflation forecast kind of restated, same deal, drifting down from a peak over the next few years. Okay, so with that in mind, the forecasts look really good at the national standpoint with a couple of caveats that I'll get to as we go through the rest of this today. But for the most part, we have recovered and the basic juice of growth is still in the economy. The inflation thing is the one specter that's gonna flop around for a little while in such a way that we really don't know the best way out. We don't have inflation experience in the American economy really since the early 1980s in such a way to know what to do with spiking inflation because we don't know how to decompose the supply from the demand characteristics. If we don't know how to do that, policy movements that try to attack demand very quickly can be very dangerous because they'll actually force the supply side to contract more quickly than it already is and force us toward a recession. Okay, so let's talk briefly about what's going on in Eastern Europe beyond the, the social and cultural and political disaster that it is, okay? From, from here's the dismal scientist's take, right? Because let's just wade through everything else and get to the cold-blooded aspect of what must be happening. For the Russian economy, for this to really pinch the Russian economy, it must not have so-called white knights. It should not be able to find a release or a leakage somewhere like in China that will give them the economic resources to continue this. The sanctions, I wrote a book on sanctions. It was my dissertation topic are really very as tight as we've ever seen since the Second World War. This has been an amazing, you know, sort of an observational time for me, watching what the American economy and really what most of the emerged world has done. But in the medium run, if this thing continues to trickle forward into 100th, 150th day, how much it's, it, the Russian economy is able to continue to do this will depend on where they can find markets for whatever they're able to sell. And if they can continue to finance those, the, the war machine, if you will, and this is why you're sort of seeing some repositioning in, in uh, Ukraine right now, because they don't know what they're going to do. So they're really trying to consolidate gains where they can. That seems to be what they're doing. But what's that going to do from, another, from a couple standpoints with respect to California? Expect fuel prices to remain relatively elevated because they're determined by markets that aren't uh, local. They're, they're determined by global markets. And California tends to have relatively higher priced gas anyway. 
Why that's important is because whether or not you think this way, it may not change your consumption at home, but our lower wage workers feel that gas price increase as a basically as a regressive tax, okay? Especially those that have to commute to work. That throws another friction into our labor markets for people to take a job if offered, if the wage is not commensurate with the higher costs that they face. The second thing though on the positive side is it may rearrange travel uh, with respect to people saying, okay, we can finally go to Europe. They say, man, I'm not going to Europe. So that might mean people start coming to California because it's domestic and they see California's Europe light in terms of the potential experiences. And Napa, uh, San Luis Obispo, San Diego, the, the sort of the coastline of, of California and the wine country tend to provide at least, you know, a, a marketing tactic, a more European experience. We'll see. So we might see a little bit of that. In the long run, a lot of bets are off. The longer and longer this goes, it's really going to depend on what happens with, with Russia in terms of so-called regime change. Think about what must happen on the other side of this when it's all said and done. And the importance now of shifting priorities, let's say at the federal level, from the full recovery of the American economy to spending more on defense. Okay. So we just heard that the presidential budget has an increase at the Pell Grant side of it that was actually relatively significant. Did everybody hear that news about the presidential budget? We got that pickup in the Pell Grant. That may not go through now. That may be one of the sacrificial lambs that takes place because they now see that defense has got to be a larger priority. And one of the ways that the, the sort of horse trading aspects of Congress will take place is you'll see some changes there. So watch for those kind of things, right? But for that, we probably would have seen the presidential budget stay basically as it is. Like in California, the gubernatorial budget basically is pretty much what it is in January when you see it. There's a couple of things that can happen in more volatile years but we're probably gonna see a lot of volatility, especially because we just passed this year's fiscal budget in DC like three weeks ago, right? So now we still gotta to get to September 30 and hope to Christ they actually get that one done, we'll see. But the other thing that might be really good, especially for CTE and thinking about community college programs is will we see more of a commitment to a green economy as a result of higher fuel prices? So one of the positive opportunity costs of having higher gas prices while gas companies are making very high profits is to drive consumers and other businesses as entrepreneurs thinking, wow, if those guys are making profits like that, can I kick the legs out from underneath them and do something that actually steals a market that's something different? And we've been walking that direction for a while. California, though, be cautious. When you pop over the mountains and you start moving toward places like Nebraska, not everybody there's driving a Tesla. Okay, so be cautious that you watch, you're driving around, oh yeah, yeah, we've got this electric vehicle thing nailed, right? Watch out for that when you see the, the big boy trucks as you get into Omaha, okay? But there are, but, but DC has a lot of policies rolling along toward getting more green energy. This might accelerate it, but for what happens with the midterms. So watch for that too. Okay. Oh, I said at the end that the Cold War now has a sequel. We probably already know that. Okay. So for workforce development at the federal level. So generally speaking, the forecast looks good, but the shift in federal funding after this year is going to be very dependent on what happens in the midterms and how priorities shift at the same time. Construction is going to probably be a, still a focus because that, that basically is a very strong industry in almost every red or blue state. So politically, we'll probably see that continue. The thing that's tricky about, con about construction, and I'll talk about this more in a minute, we talk about with respect to California, is the cost of construction. So part of that inflation spike is also the cost of materials for construction businesses alongside of rising wages. So how many more housing units are we really gonna get in California regardless of all the hand waving about six blocks from here, okay? It's very tough to know how that's actually gonna play out. It sounds great in a stump speech, but when you actually put a hammer in your hand and go, oh my God, it's really gonna cost this much to build this house, it changes your perspective, okay? The good thing is though, there's, there should be at least funding, partnership, and some at least initial momentum, which means we're going to see more people having, they're going to be more demand in construction for construction jobs, especially trained people. One of the things about the current situation, if you talk to contractors, they're basically taking any warm body that they can find. At some point, that warm body is going to get hurt or hurt somebody else. And they're going to say, okay, hold on a minute. We need to now find somebody who's actually been trained by a community college. Okay. So watch for that kind of backlash as things move on. And on the STEM side, there's also a lot of movement in DC about uh, making sure that there's more STEM education. Uh, and we should expect that some of the occupations that I'm gonna show you in a minute, most of them are gonna need some STEM if, if previously they didn't need a whole lot at all. That's all moving forward. And some of that's gonna be simply as a bridge toward more automation, believe it or not. So this is really a more medium run than long run thing I'm gonna tell you in a minute. But a lot of that is coming out of what's happened with the pandemic. 
we, we are moving toward a more automated society. In the initial stage, people will be providing that automation, then artificial intelligence will provide that automation. Okay, now let's move to California. I'm gonna show you the same graph I showed you, not through March, but through February, because those are the latest data for California. Same deal. It took about 72 months for California to get through the Great Recession in terms of its labor markets. But once again, think of it as a filter. Where, did, where was there a reallocation of jobs within that? So for example, yeah, we went from the same volume of workers, about 16 million, back to 16 million, 72 months. So six years basically of no growth in our labor markets in California. And that's why we called it the Great Recession. But within that, construction really got hammered. We saw a lot of people lose their jobs in this wild reallocation of construction workers throughout basically the Western United States, but California, we saw a lot of movement. Then as housing markets reacquired themselves, we saw a lot of contractors come back. But that, that change was a reallocation of the workforce. Now, COVID-19 has a similar look at the national level. California dipped farther than the national average initially, has grown a little bit more slowly, and is 96.3% back to where we were in January 2020, which means we should cross that red dotted line somewhere in the third or fourth quarter of this year, rather than, let's say, in the next couple of months. But everything looks good in terms of getting back to that same volume of workers. What is tricky for us as educators is the next slide, because this one, yes, as I'm looking at my slides, it is the next slide this time, the reallocation amongst industries and where job losses remain. Let's look at that now. What I'm going to show you is I'm going to show you the changes in jobs using 20, January 2020 as a benchmark, and then we're going to walk through April and May 2020, the really sharp cuts in jobs, and then move very quickly to the latest data. So here's the original sharp cuts. This is one of the very few recessions since the Second World War. We saw general job cuts across all industries simultaneously. And, and that's what happens. You turn your economy off and you get job losses basically everywhere. But notice the magnitude of those losses were different. Where I want you to kind of start focusing your energy is on the far right-hand side, specifically the last three slots, which are leisure and, leisure and hospitality. What I'll try to explain is other services in a minute and then government. Okay. Here's December 2020. January or June 2021, December 2021. So that's the end of last year. So now let's stop there briefly and notice that for the most part, that yellow column was up from the bottom. There's one specific industry that actually had popped up over the red line, which is transportation, utilities, and logistics and warehousing. Basically exactly what you would expect. We took more of our lives, moved it online, had more deliveries, specifically last mile deliveries to home. So that industry popped up in terms of the number of workers, somewhat shifting workers who lost their jobs on that far right-hand side, finding jobs in transportation and logistics. Then we have January, January, sorry, December, 2021. That's actually December, 2021, sorry. January 22, and this is the latest data. Okay, so same story, but here's the news. If you look at that, you look at the far right, we have some jobs or some industries that are still very much struggling to get back to where they were pre-pandemic. So the meaning of that negative 9.7 with leisure and hospitality means is that we're almost 10% down in the total number of workers that were working in bars, restaurants, hotels, and event centers as we were in January 2020, seasonally adjusted. Okay, 10% down. That's more than two years on from the beginning of the, or basically two years, I shouldn't say more than, basically two years. Okay. Other services is this weird amalgam of things that we don't really characterize very well in other industries, which are hair salons, nail salons, nonprofits that don't have anything to do with healthcare, auto body shops, fitness centers, crematoria, that kind of stuff. So all that stuff is in there, negative 8.2. Okay. What's nasty about both of those categories is that they are filled with jobs that have relatively easy entry for workers. For the most part, a high school diploma will get you into a job in those two categories. The question for economists, and we still don't have enough data to know exactly what's going on there yet, is how many of those jobs that are lost are now permanently gone? Meaning two things have happened. One, that the nature of our economy has shifted as a result of COVID-19, that we will never see those businesses higher at the same level again, because you'll be replaced by a piece of equipment, some type of technology, or you're, you have now shifted your model to have fewer workers and thus not expose yourself as an employer to as many problems with employees as you did previous to COVID. For example, you might be betting that if you have another round of COVID, you don't wanna hire at the same capacity and have the same problem occur again with all that wage exposure. So 
this is true, especially in event centers where we don't know the demand, bars and restaurants where demand might be a little bit tricky if there's another mandate to shut down a little bit. Like, for example, if you walked around the last few weeks in California, people are still kind of wearing their masks, not wearing their masks. Now we're hearing, you know, we, we've heard around that we had another variant running around, which seemed to have been dissipated to a certain extent. That uncertainty will keep businesses from hiring, okay? Especially where the risks are relatively high. The problem is the centerpiece of that is, in, is really where our high school students find work the easiest. Now, notice there are some positive aspects here. Business, professional and business services pop right back up, and that was expected. Uh, education and health, predominantly health. I'll talk about education when I talk about government in just a second. And then transportation and warehousing has gone absolutely bonkers, and we should expect that to continue at least for the next few years. But if you look at government, government's kind of this weird mix of public education and public service jobs, okay? Public education, as far as the way we, we look at the labor markets, is still down. The total number of teachers that we're using is still down from where we were pre-pandemic. But there's been a lot of government retirements, so the other thing that's tricky about looking at these data is that this, these data suggest the number of people working by industry, but it could be that we've had people who have chosen to leave it and then they did not rehire behind them. How many people know somebody who's retired and your institution does not intend to rehire that position anytime soon? Assume that's a mantra that will stick around for five or seven more years. Okay. Okay. Looking at our, what we call our metropolitan statistical areas, hopefully you can see this okay. There's only about seven or eight metro areas in California that have actually seen job growth and have actually fully recovered. There's a lot that are still quite a ways away. So places like Marin County, Napa County, Butte County, Solano County, San Francisco and San Mateo counties, Ventura, are still further away than the California average from actually finding uh, themselves back to the same number of workers that we were at right before the pandemic. Now, the ones that have gone, San Joaquin, Riverside, Tulare, Madera, Yuba and Sutter, Imperial Shasta, what do all those have in common? There's two kind of basic characteristics, one that's classic, the other one that you only may know if you live there. Come on now. Okay, so I heard kind of some rumbling, some grumbling. Okay, so one is that they're generally somewhat rural, right? Riverside, not so much, but the other ones are to a certain extent. The second one is they didn't have as restrictive policies locally, okay? Which, you know, if you think about, well, I mean, they weren't wearing masks. Yep. And things kind of went on as normal in some places around places like Shasta County, okay? So the, the one thing that was positive about that, of course, is it didn't contract your economy as much. The negative about that is, is it kind of showed this sort of sub-federalism that this government in California was a little bit concerned about, okay? but we seem to have walked through it okay. The more rural you were, the less adherence there was to the strictest of policies that we had at one time. All right, this is the forecast. So as part of the governor's budget, the Department of Finance puts forward a forecast in a bunch of different ways. This is the forecast from January, 2022 with respect to where we think jobs are going. And that's the evolution over the next, let's say four years. So starting at the end of the, fourth quarter or the end of the third quarter of 2021, that's the forecast going forward. That blue line crosses the dotted line at the beginning of 2023. Okay. So the supposition right now is that California will at the end of the day, recover all the jobs lost at the end of this year or by the end of this year, absolute max. And we seem to be on that. The data I showed you in actuality seem to point that direction. And when the governor's revise comes out in about a month, this forecast will be updated and will likely have a little faster pace of growth. Okay, so that's good news. For the most part, we're seeing jobs come back, but remember that reallocation is critical. And I'll say that in the last slide, why that's so important. Here's the evolution of the forecast inside of that, looking at the industrial level, but I'm gonna show this to you in three chunks. This is the growth rate of jobs from the bottom of the great recession to the tippy top of the growth phase in the 2010s. Okay, so non-farm payroll, meaning everything outside of agriculture, there's about 21% growth of jobs from the bottom of the recession, Great Recession, to right before the pandemic. Okay, this is what happened in the pandemic. So if you take the, the peak and then go to the bottom in 2020, which by the end of 2020, we basically had bottomed out, those same industries had those negative numbers. Negative numbers 
across every single major industry sector, okay? Now, why is it ordered in this slightly jumbled way? It's because of the next one. That's the forecast. So the highest forecasted jobs are in transportation and warehousing, ambulatory health, okay? professional and technical services, social assistance, which primarily, if you look at that so-called social assistance category, most of that's nonprofit health. Construction, okay? Information, which is technology, basically. But leisure and hospitality acts through 2025 might actually get a pickup a little bit from where it was right before the recession began, okay? So they're actually still predicting that that market might be okay. I'm not that optimistic. But this is where right now the latest forecasts are for California as a state through the middle of this decade with respect to the industrial employment or how employers are looking at hiring. If you go to the bottom, you'll see some things that might be a little bit more shocking. For example, you'll see wholesale is down a little bit. Uh, retail is down quite a bit. And then we have some things like uh, small, or I shouldn't say light manufacturing and mining and logging that we expect to kind of go away. And California is contracting naturally along those lines because they're being less and less worried about fossil fuel. Okay. One industry in specific is that travel industry. So why am I a little pessimistic through 2025 about this potential 6% growth from the peak before the pandemic to 2025 for leisure and hospitality jobs? Well, here, I'm gonna to try to show you this. Hopefully you can see those data. If you can't, those two oval circled numbers are basically the same number. If you can see that top line that has 2018, 2019, 2020, that's a four year gap, right? It's gonna take four plus years to go from the same amount of spending by tourism in California back to that same level by the latest forecasts out there for travel in California. It doesn't make sense that industries that help or that basically service tourism are gonna hire back above and beyond pre-pandemic levels that they themselves have not even recovered the same level of revenue, okay? And that's just domestic spending. That second set of ovals is international visitors to California. So we're still years away from recovering the same amount of revenues that existed in California with respect to visitor spending by most of the forecasts that are out there. This is meant to be kind of an amalgam of those forecasts. How are we ever gonna see those folks get a job back? So if your community college has a relatively robust training program in hospitality jobs, it's gonna be a little while before those jobs come back. So when you're training those students, you gotta think, where are they gonna go? And of course, the students are gonna be thinking about that too. Okay. All right, so let's start wrapping up. Median housing price growth. Look at those numbers. So this is a, this is a sampling of the 58 counties in California on average, but California on average over the last 12 months has seen about 22% increase, a little over 21, I'm sorry, percent increase in median home prices. So when you're driving down the street, this is that three bedroom, two bathroom, 1600 square foot track home in your neighborhood, okay? 21% higher than it was 12 months ago. And these, and to a certain extent, show you the largest, but then on the far right-hand side, San Francisco is actually the lowest. San Francisco initially went down for about eight months, actually saw a contraction in median home prices, and then picked back up in 2021. So that last 12 months, we've actually seen gains of about 12% in San Francisco. And San Francisco is one of the highest priced markets, not only in California, but in the United States. Now, here's the last 24 months, okay? So why is this important? Two major reasons. One, this is very strong, not unprecedented, but very strong growth. And as I said earlier, when we talked about inflation, one of the main drivers in inflation is housing prices. So when we talk about housing equity, and the equal availability of housing resources to either buy or rent to everybody as, as a potential goal of policy, we got a lot farther away the last two years. But if you're a homeowner and you bring your, your pitchfork and your torch to your random city council and board of supervisors meeting in your county and say, you can't build all those houses here, this is what you get for that. And your lower and middle, middle income workers get farther and farther away from ownership, which means they're more transitory by nature because they're not rooted with an asset locally. Now, as somebody who's an economist, the problem with that is, is that that's the way the market works. And it sucks for some people. That's the dismal scientist aspect. But the reason why that's important, your workers are gonna want higher wages, your students are gonna want higher wages because they're gonna be facing this consistent pressure in housing markets. Now we might see a housing price contraction, but it's gonna be coming from relatively high peaks. Okay. This is the forecast for the next 12 months. 
This is, this is arranged in such a way to kind of carve out the middle. The lowest growth is Lake County, California at 7.8% for the next 12 months, but Lake County, California, anybody here from Lake? I know Cita's here sort of from Lake, uh, but she's not 100% from Lake. Okay. Lake County saw about 40% growth the median home price over the last two years. So having another 7.8 in not that big a deal, but that means your Lake County rural wine country county median home price has gone up almost 50% compounded in three years if this plays out, okay? But San Diego, which already sta started, how many of you live in San Diego here? Housing prices have been cheap there for a while. They might go up another 25%, 12 months. And I love San Diego. San Diego is an amazing place. Um, but with that in mind, expect prices aren't going to go down anytime soon. Okay. Well, part of that's a supply and demand problem. So all the same demand characteristics there. And to a certain extent, folks, even as interest rates rise, one of the little things you might not know that you learn about when you, when you dig a little bit into the banking system is that when you're at very rel or relatively low interest rates and interest rates start to pick up, it actually is not necessarily detrimental to housing prices initially. Because what will happen is, is that it was already relatively low and we're kind of sitting around, honey, I don't know if we should buy this house or not. Okay, well, you know, interest rates are pretty low. We can wait. Then interest rates start to creep up. No, can't wait anymore. So I, then I take advantage of that rate. So housing price on the demand side are, continue, are supported a little while as interest rates initially creep up. And then there's a twist point at which rates go up enough to say, okay, we're done for right now because now it's too costly to buy that house. And then prices start to soften. That's why those forecasts still look relatively robust, even if interest rates are rising and there might be a little bit of a slower growth rate in the economy, because that's the way housing markets and interest rates work to a certain extent. Okay? If I showed you a two or three year forecast, they would be flattening out much more quickly. But the other part is supply. This is the evolution of the number of housing units built, I'm sorry, permitted to be built in California over the last, let's say, 18-ish years or so. These data ended right at the end of 2021. And then the forecast that's out there going forward. But this is for single-family homes, and this is for multifamily. So generally, apartments for rent. Okay, Not a skyrocketing growth over the next few years. Now, positive and negative. Positive, the supply side of our housing markets thus will be relatively in check, which if you own a home is good. If you're a renter, however, it might be bad because there won't be a lot of additional competition out there on the rental side, right? Remember that's those two kind of walk hand in hand. So I mean, good for you that owns, it's bad for folks that are renting and trying to move into a home because it's getting farther and farther away and it costs them more for rent. But neither side looks like it's gonna go. So again, Six blocks from here, here a lot of hand waving. We need to build more homes, we need to build more homes. There is no forecast that suggests we're gonna see a real fast evolution of that anytime soon. What the other negative of that, unfortunately, is that if you have a lot of strong construction programs or let's say trades programs you're training for, how, much more work, how many more workers are really gonna be needed if this is the environment for new housing? Now, of course, there's been remodeling boom. I mean, if you know people that have remodeled their homes in the last 24 months, that's been crazy too. But that's going to slow down as soon as interest rates rise. And that one goes before the, the purchase of a home does. Remodeling demand sags more quickly as interest rates rise than, than as we buy homes. And that's the forecasted part right there. One thing that's also got developers a little concerned is where the population of California is going. So this is the evolution of the components that change California's population since, the year, since fiscal year 1999-2000. Here's the number of kids that were born, the number of people that passed. The net inbound foreign residents, so we, we exchange with other countries in California, and they come here to live, we go there to live. Uh, that's the net, positive across the board. We, we attract the world's population to work here. But this is what's happened domestically with migration. So almost all negative. So why is that important? Well, we heard a lot of anecdote, in, especially right after the recession began, or I'm sorry, the pandemic began and the very quick recession happened that people were given the choice to live remotely said, hey, why am I paying this much to live here if my wages aren't changing and hold that thought and I can go live in Des Moines, right? Well, they did that. And in fact, the Census Bureau and the Department of Finance have both estimated that California lost population for the first time in recorded history, okay? In the fiscal year 2020, 2021. Now, if you think about that, let's go back to the housing market and the labor market and think about the goods and the bads. On the housing market side, that is, might be a little tricky in the sense that 
it might be where there won't be as many people looking to buy a home in California. It might be good on the rental side because it might lead to a little bit more vacancy and a little less pressure on prices. But from a developer side, if I don't know if there's going to be a population to buy new homes, why am I going to go through the same process I went in 2002 to 2006 when I was building homes quickly, assuming people wanted to own homes, but the population is contracting, who's going to buy all these now new single family homes? So watch for those kind of arguments as these population data continue to evolve. Here's where it gets a little weirder. This is the current forecast through 2050 from the Department of Finance, who has a really good demography unit. And it's actually been pretty good in terms of its consistency with respect to a population growth. They expect that while it turned down this year, it's not going to stay down. We're going to get a little bit of growth in 21, 22 and kind of keep growing. But notice it peaks. 2023, they're predicting is the peak of California population. And then it's going to start going down in trend after that. What would be doing that? What are two reasons why we might see that from the, from the slide we just saw? Birth rate goes down and retirements, which leads to what type of population, younger or older? Older. Okay, let's go back one slide if we can briefly. When I show you this, remember that blue column is babies born and the red is people passing on and then the, the purple and the green are kind of the net migration or the, what you'd assume is the movement of either retirees or workers into California net, which was negative. Okay, so it would be great if we increase birth rates. The problem with birth rates is we don't get a worker out of that birth rate for at least 18 more years, right? When we have migration, we get a worker almost immediately. So if people are leaving California that are working residents otherwise, and we're gaining access to more retirees who do not see themselves working, population may not change, but the composition of that population with respect to workforce is changing. Okay, now let's go back. That, that's the sort of two basic foundations of why this dem demographic forecast looks the way it does. By the time we hit 2033, we will have flipped it in such a way that the birth rates and the aging of the California populace will now lead to a slower growing population. And in fact, we'll see a reduction in that population. Okay, that has a lot of challenge in front of it. Why that's concerning is the high school graduate levels are all falling down in terms of, fall, of, of um, forecasting. Now, if you're in Glen County, anybody here from Glen County? Butte County? Oh, right on. Oh, yeah, Blaine, I know you. I'm sorry. Thank you. So Glen County is actually somehow going to have 25.6% more high school graduates in it than it had in 2019-20 from a very small base population. That's the current forecast. Well, all that depends on who moves to Glen County. Okay. So a lot of those sort of demographic shifts play into this, but notice who's up there. Glenn, Sutter, Mariposa, El Dorado, Kern, Mono, Lassen, Kings County, not your urban counties in California. What do those look like? They look like this. So these are the current forecasts. And if you go to the far right, we're still in some sort of, you know, rural aspects, but Napa County, Marin County, Los Angeles County, all deep in the 15 to 17% or more reduction in the number of high school graduates in those counties, cumulative over that 10 or 12 year stretch. Why? Aging population, fewer kids being born, okay? And less migration in of families. One could hypothesize that's because of housing prices. One could also hypothesize that the types of jobs being offered are not going to bring in people to stay. Fire has some aspect of it. Thank you, Blaine. That's, that is true that we've seen some of that, um, what you'll find, though, is if the economic opportunities are strong enough, people will get over the fire. If I can get paid a quarter million dollars a year, I'll live there anyway. I'll roll the dice. But, it, but it's got to be high enough to, to, to you know, sort of play that out, and that's the trick. Okay. Now, let's get down to the meaty part of this. You take everything I said, and we'll start wrapping up now in earnest. This is where the forecasted occupational growth is going to be. So the things we actually train for as educators, this is the current forecast as of right now. If you read those titles, what is the dominant industry you see? Health, okay? With a little bit of construction and logistics kind of thrown in there, here and there. Why would health be the dominant occupational growth in California from the things we just said? Yeah, we're turning into a bunch of old farts is the deal, right? So the supposition is, is we're, gonna, we're not gonna have wellness. We're gonna have white and red wine as our number one category of what to do. And when, as that happens, we're gonna have more inbounds in ICUs. Okay, 
So that, those are the kind of things to watch for in terms of these forecasts. Now, is it tough from a community college and from a four-year university or even from a high school standpoint to, to double down on those kind of programs? Because those are expensive programs to run, right? If you want to do it right. But the forecast you're going to see emerge over the next 12 or 24 months are going to be very consistent and very similar. They're going to talk about how much growth we're going to see in the healthcare side. Now, we've gone through this before. How many people remember the great nursing hunt of the late 2000s into the early 2010s? You may remember when people were going bananas that we were going to have this huge shortage of nurses and the whole thing, the whole legs were coming out from underneath nursing. And then somebody was looking around at each other going, we got too many nurses now. Remember all that happening? It happened at our university. It's like, oh man, you got to be kidding me. But you're going to see some reticence probably because of that memory. But this is where the forecasts are at least going. I noticed I had home health and personal care aids were sort of the array of HHA, CNA, all, all the sort of you know, classic acronyms that come around with... Um, if you think about it, middle skill healthcare workers. And folks, again, I want to be, I should be cautious and not say this in the sort of hand wavy general way. This is all middle skill. This is not high or low. So if you don't know in the, in the labor data, middle skill jobs or occupations are, are defined by those that need something higher than a high school diploma, but not a baccalaureate degree to be the, the prime way you get the job. Okay. So here's the career pathway piece. So this is what those forecasts then translate into in terms of the positive and negative. And I, and I ordered these alphabetically so they were relatively easy to see the one you might be most affiliated with. The most positive ones are transportation, health science and medical technology and, and construction. And to a certain extent, if you look at all the forecasts, those are the big three to the, end, to the middle of this decade that we're seeing in terms of occupational growth. There's a sprinkle of some other things. We might see a little bit in agriculture. We might see a little bit in some environs around manufacturing and design. How much that's actually gonna play out to in, in, in earnest, we will see. But folks, this is what the forecast currently looks like for those alphabetized pathways. Okay, so what's it all mean? From a macro standpoint, folks, things are getting a little tougher rather than better. What's going on in Eastern Europe has got more uncertainty going than we, is really kind of necessary, but it is. So it's tricky. We will see how that goes, but like, expect there to be more volatility than less or more of a smooth movement than we expected, but for what's happening in Eastern Europe. Our enrollment numbers remain a challenge. So I don't know what's going on in your institution, but at my institution, we're very concerned about how students are going to come back, if they're going to come back, and will it be the same? We have an enormous amount of investment in infrastructure and physical capital on our campuses. Will that be demanded in the same way if we're at three quarters the number of bodies going forward in terms of those that want to come to campus? Housing markets, you, you got to expect some slowdown, but that slowdown might be to 2 or 3% growth after 45% growth. That is amazing. But that amazing aspect of it has its costs. And that cost will trickle into higher wages, slower employment level, employment growth, and more consternation on the, on the part of employers because the wage demands are going to be rising. And again, those are the big three we're looking at. The one thing I do want to say, though, is if you look around at the forecast and what's being written out there about occupations, almost every single one of them says, start training people in STEM regardless of what they used to do pre-pandemic. So even your run-of-the-mill carpenter, your run-of-the-mill weight person, should have at least some base technical knowledge when they go through a training program of what the latest and greatest types of technology are in the industry they intend to go into. So bolting that on to everything we do is going to become more and more of a norm. So watch for that. Now, the nasty part of that is, where do we find the instructors that have that background? When I talk to people, they say the, big, the great thing is the students want STEM. We can't find instructors, A, that will stick around long enough because of what they have demanded for their own labor possibilities, but second, in, especially in our more rural areas, where are we going to find people that are qualified to provide that kind of education and thus keep them around? Right? Now, we might find that in our aged workforce that now has maybe moved to a more rural area of California and wants to do something, but that doesn't mean they're the best teachers. Right? So we need to watch for that too. The warm body philosophy is not great for students sometimes. Okay? It's just like being in certain, certain occupations are not good CEOs either. Okay. So folks, with that, thank you so much. That's where we're at. Pretty decent, not super, but not bad. Thank you again for having me. Amy, do we have time for questions? Okay, great. Yeah, they got a microphone. Folks, we got a question. I think we got a microphone floating around here. Okay, and then we got somebody in the back next.
it's like my newsfeed knew that you were going to be here today, uh, Dr. Eiler, because one of the articles that came up was recession shock. Yeah. And, and I know you probably talked in and around that today, but what you talked about today, when we see those headlines like that, what does that mean? What, what is the headline called recession shock? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Recession shock, if you hear that, and I'm not exactly blaming the 100% the context in which you saw it, but we almost everything we've heard over the last 12 or 18 months is that we're going to grow as an economy and kind of keep on trucking toward the middle of this decade. So I think what normally when you're hearing that is that, is there something that's suddenly going to tip the scales in terms of the way we're thinking about the macro economy and that we're going to see a recession where we didn't expect it to happen? That's the idea. What are the two precursors we should be watching for that? Is one, we don't see some, uh, some change in inflation that's obvious, right? So that's why I said what to watch. If policy is working correctly in terms of rising interest rates, you will see obvious changes in the progression of prices. You'll see some downturn. But folks, I'm going to give you a little economic hint. Businesses, when they raise prices, don't enjoy lowering them. Especially, especially places like restaurants or grocery stores because they spend an enormous amount of time or cost, relatively speaking, changing all those prices in the first place. And if you're still going there and demanding their services, why would I roll back prices? Now, in some cases in the grocery store, that it'll be true more completely in the produce side because the produce markets will either be more frothy and the supply and demand will play out in such a way that they're gonna drop prices. This is also true in things like um, fresh meat. But in things that are packaged goods, those prices might linger around at relatively high levels and just wait for your income to adjust. So they might not increase anymore, but they won't necessarily go down. So that's where it'll happen. And then the housing piece is the other trick there. If housing starts to see some contraction quickly, that, that's where people start to freak out about recession. But think again, supply and demand. If there's not a whole lot of building happening, where's that supply gonna come from? And if the demand is still relatively frothy, people just sit on their houses and wait. So that it's watching that inventory, which has remained low for almost you know, 12 years now. So that, that's where the so-called recession shock might be coming is we weren't expecting it, but now the, the specter of it starting to emerge. I have a question about construction. Mm. So I noticed you had strong, steady curves upward for construction. It's an area of growth. You had about 10% uh, between now and 2025. Yep. But in November, uh, Congress did pass the infrastructure bill, $1.2 trillion, and that's uh, supposed to be about $1.5 million in the construction, uh, 1.5 million jobs per year for the next 10 years. That seems to me that would have created a spike um, and something we should be thinking about because you talked about housing and construction, but not the commercial infrastructure bill. Could you address that? Totally. So the reason why you saw the trend the way it is is because that... $1.2 trillion does not hit the street simultaneously, right? It, it gets spread out over time. So the more spread out it is, the less and less you need an increase in construction jobs to take care of the projects that are coming online. So it, it's probably more like 1.2 million jobs over the spending package rather than per annum in growing and compounding. So and, and think about 1.2 million construction jobs for California, that might be another 150 to 200,000 jobs over an eight to 10 year stretch. So no, nothing that will significantly move the needle, but the cool thing about the infrastructure spending is two things. Is one, it will support other parts of construction wobbling a little bit, uh, even though another sort of quick sidebar is that how, residential construction and heavy infrastructure construction are two kind of separate markets generally. Uh, the second thing is we might get infrastructure that will change other markets in a way that are positive for California, specifically in energy markets. So that kind of construction can create new jobs that weren't here before, rather than, let's say, shifting around within the construction markets. So we'll see how much that plays out. But be a little cautious when you see those kind of jobs estimates, because so much of those job estimates depend on how quickly the money rolls out. Historically, that money does not come out quickly. It's usually spread over years. We are still construction efforts you see throughout our interstate system in California is still the spending from the 2009 package called ARRA under Obama. That, that money is still trickling to its end point. Thank you. Um, so I'm looking at, you know, with the projection of the different occupations that look like there'll be an increase. Yep. And I'm trying to figure out what to do with the tension around. So we have a responsibility, right, to not just help our students get a job, but get 
a well-paying job, a sustainable job for their family, all of that. Now, depending on where you live, some of the jobs that are in high demand that we're projecting a growth, they're also low wage jobs and people aren't staying. So what from an economic forecast or historical view can you share that might help us understand what are the conditions in which we would start to see wage increases in those currently low paying fields that are in demand or gonna be even more in demand? And what is the role of educators in I don't know, accelerating that wage increase? Should we just teach everybody labor rights? Like, what do we do to help them increase that and sort of play off the fact that there's a high demand and yet there's no one left to fill those because they're not the high paying wages? That is probably the question of the decade, what you just asked. Because almost every single workforce development effort you see is where can we find quote unquote good jobs over the next four or five years and trying to place students or anybody we train into those jobs in such a way to kind of keep demand and supply walking hand in hand and hopefully to get wage gains along the way, right? So for, let me answer your second question first. It's very tough for educators short of the education lobbies to really push on those items because you will run afoul of chambers of commerce and business associations who are your natural partners in those efforts and say, well, we want higher wages for our workers and our students when they get trained and they're going out there. And the business association are saying, we've already been pinched on all sides, including the minimum wage legislation into a higher cost of doing business. So we might not be able to take all the people you train if the wages go up more quickly than we're expecting. And that natural friction is going to play out over the next few years, not guaranteed. So that unfortunately is part one. You need to be, you need to tread very lightly on how hard you push it while at the same time, recognizing that without that push, you may not have as many demand as much student demand for those programs in the first place because the wages won't be there for me. The other piece, which is something just as a warning, I'm going to give you two kind of pieces of that. One is that good jobs will morph in terms of their, their definitions in some ways, but I think we've all kind of accepted the idea that we want good jobs, which means the people who work in those jobs can afford to live in our areas, right? We think of those as sort of connected to the local housing prices in, in a sense, not, not increasing the so-called housing burden that our workers face or the percentage of their monthly income that they pay for housing. The nasty part about economics is as soon as you increase those wages, rents go up because landlords know that if there's been general regional wage increases, our renters can now pay more. So they're gonna use that to maybe speed things on along as long as they can. So one thing you can get a little more active in is trying to work with the landlord lobby, whether that's commercial real estate that focuses on multifamily or local landlords who have come together in some way of an association to try to work together to not increase rates or rents as quickly as the market may or may not bear. But that's a very nasty thing to get into. I have, I have lobbied on both sides of the rent control issue in terms of providing economic data and thought when I've been asked. And neither side is 100% right and neither side is 100% wrong. It's very tricky. And, and the economics are relatively clear. If you pay more wages in your local area, if you look at every other every area that has relatively high household incomes, rents are naturally a little higher than other places. The second part of that is the thing about our urban areas. So one of the biggest riddles we need to solve is if we have people not coming back to the office at the same magnitude, what happens to the jobs that were subsidized by inbound commuters every day in our core urban areas that may not come back? So we have all those jobs in sort of secondary and tertiary circles around the core office spaces in our urban areas for which we have been maybe training or been partnership with those businesses to provide students for some time that won't be coming back or might be 80% of their pre-pandemic levels because the number of people coming back to the office might be 80 to 85% of the pre-pandemic level. And the demand just simply won't be there. And it's exacerbated by a lack of business travel. So when you add all those pieces up, we need to be cautious that if we think pre-pandemic is coming back at some point, that's why I keep that warning throughout my talk about watch for the reallocation within. So at the aggregate, you might get back. But if you don't have those leisure and hospitality jobs, it might be structural and you might be at 90% of where you were pre-pandemic forever. So we, we need to be cautious that even if those are rising wage jobs locally, they may never hire the same number of workers they did before. So, hey, wages are rising. Let's get this workforce ready. It may not be demanded. I think we got a question up here. Oh, great. We got one more up here too. Um, so drawing on what you just said, I am curious, um, given that a lot of jobs over the during the pandemic 
what we found was, and we've always been part of this global economy, but what we really saw was that a lot of jobs were able to kind of be done remotely, mm -hmm. right? And what I've heard anecdotally is that there's been a lot of folks that have actually left California and are still working, still their jobs are here in California, but they're no longer here in California. Yep. So I have a two part question. One, I don't know the extent to which that's true or what percentage of a, of a sort of exodus we've seen. And the second part is if there is, what is the impact on California's economy, if any? Absolutely, the huge questions, other, other big questions for the rest of this decade. The data are still emerging on the number of people who have left California whose employers are in California. But part of the data that suggests we've lost the labor force in California has got to be people who've moved away and, and are doing something else. We, we count our, our, our labor data counts what employers report as the number of people working for them if they have payroll employment. It's a survey of those, of those employers. So some of those jobs that leave California will still be counted as California jobs by the nature of how the data is reported. So that's caveat one. Caveat two is that if that person leaves and becomes, let's say, an independent contractor, th that's really where the data would shift, or you'd have to see some remote office open up in, you know, let's say, Denver, Colorado, to actually have a shift in the labor data that was significant. So that, but so that's on the data side and trying to say, well, they're not, they haven't left here. The data are right back where we saw it, that I can't be that can't mean they left. They have. We we haven't seen the data to really describe that yet, but anecdotally and I think just practically, we should think that they did. What are the bigger effects of that happening? And you can also say, what are the bigger effects of people remaining remote? Uh, the bigger effects of people leaving the state is that you will lose that sort of more fungible workforce of folks that would have the job opening comes up, they're qualified to take it, they take it, that opens a job behind them. Now they may keep that job because they want to stay remote and don't want to rock the boat. And that job that would have come behind them as they went to some other new company that was here or something changing won't be rehired. So if I, for example, instead of looking in San Jose for 10 job openings, I might now be willing to hire somebody in Charlotte, North Carolina, because I had their neighbor on my payroll before, and I won't necessarily look at somebody who's living in San Jose to fill that, because I don't want them to come in the office enough to hire them here. So that's part one. Part two is that the remote worker, it, it, it's that same urban issue I said before. Not only is that, that worker may stay in work, but by the fact that person's now not commuting into an urban area means that somebody else lost their job. So there's a weird trade-off the more remote work we have, and that to a certain extent is exacerbated when somebody's left the, the state because what they're doing with their money is now being in North Carolina and not in California. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's so a <laughs> perfect question, really nasty to answer just yet. A piggyback on that remote work, then as educators, the discussion of um, training online or not online, does that really impact then um, how we deliver these skills needs occupation? I think it does in ones that are more maybe STEM related or let's say have STEM foundations that could be done more remotely. So if, for example, if you do medical billing, you might find more and more that it won't be an in an office, it'll be more remote if you can figure out the VPN piece and keep all the HIPAA stuff in, in order where you're not, you know, having, having everything here and having it on lockdown might have been really good in the office, but now the evolution of the technology might allow you to do that. So training for flexibility in the way the worker thinks about their workplace is probably something all of, all of us that do workforce development and training need to think about rather than just say, we're training you for an office environment that may not be the case anymore for even fields that we're, we feel like are at guaranteed to do that. We might actually also see more telehealth where in fact, the delivery of healthcare by someone that used to be in the doctor's office is now happening on a secure high-speed internet connection, which you can do in your, in your bathrobe at home in theory. So, so that, those are the kind of things is just is, is making sure that the folks we train are in fact thinking about it's possible they will not necessarily be going into a classic office space or the classic, the classic setting to deliver those services. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Job Speaker is bridging the gap between education and employment for the skills-based economy. 
Working with community colleges across California, Job Speaker helps educators align educational resources with student desired career choices and deploy a career oriented infrastructure to achieve that goal. Job Speaker efficiently guides all students into and along their chosen pathway to ensure learning that prepares them for the world of work. Learn more at jobspeaker.com. Certiport, industry recognized certification for college and career readiness. Certiport is the leading provider of learning curriculum, practice tests, and performance based IT certification exams that accelerate academic and career opportunities for learners. Certiport is dedicated to helping people succeed through industry recognized certification. Our credentials are aimed at enhancing individual productivity, marketability, and value. Learn more at certiport.com.